Ah, yes, reading. Ontario's favorite pastime during these lockdowns. Wrong. What y'all watching on Netflix? Let me know. But jokes aside, I do enjoy reading. Lifeline family, welcome back to our service tonight. We are so glad you are here. And it's crazy to think that we've reached our last Tuesday of the semester. So as you guys go into finals, as you guys hit your exams, we, we normally pause our services for the summer. So we won't be doing lives like this on YouTube, but we'll have other ways to connect throughout the summer, like Bible plans and living rooms and all sorts of stuff. So definitely keep locked to our social media to find updates on how you can get connected in that way. Tonight, David has an incredible word to share tonight. We're gonna be looking at Exodus chapter 20, looking at what it means to take the Lord's name in vain. And guys, whoo! So definitely wanna keep watching this video so you can find out exactly what that means. But first, as always, let's start off with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, God, I thank you so much for this day. God, I thank you for your life, Thank you for your son. Thank you for dying on the cross for us. God, I thank you for making a way for us to know you. And so God, as we've carved out this time in our day to spend time with you, Lord, Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? Would you say everything that, that you need to say to us, God? I pray that our eyes and our ears and our hearts are open and receptive to your word tonight. God, would you anoint David to deliver the word that you have for us? God, that you would speak and use him and, and say um, exactly what you need to say tonight, Lord. God, I thank you for your word, and I just pray that each and every one of us will fall more and more in love with it and, and search for new perspective, for new answers, Lord God, and to seek your truth in your word, Lord. God, we love you, and we thank you for your presence, God. We thank you for your life, and we pray and dedicate this service to you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And now I pass it over to David. Hey guys, today we are going to talk about what it means to be a bearer. And we're going to look at Exodus chapter 20 verses 7 to 11. But before we do, Jesus came to show us the way, and then ultimately a religion was made in his name. And today there are over 2.3 billion people who say that they follow him. We call ourselves Christians, a title that bears the name of the one that it claims to represent. There are a lot of different kinds of Christians, different sects and denominations divided by differences over certain smaller things, but all united by one thing, one person, one God-man, that is Jesus. Yeshua, or Yehoshua, as he was called in his own language. Mahatma Gandhi once said, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. That, that one stings for me, because I love Yeshua. I love Jesus, and I believe the things that he said. And at the center of this mass of people who say they follow him stands the Christ who calls his disciples to follow him to the fringes, to seek and save the least, the last, and the lost. Here's a fact. Not all those who wear the label Christian represent Christ. None of us represent him perfectly. Even the most Christ-like Christians ultimately show flawed glimpses of the Messiah. When we represent him well, the hurting come closer, as they did for him. So if, if you follow Jesus, do the hurting come closer to you? Do the broken knock at your door? Hold on to that thought as we continue. Contextually, before the passage that we're about to read, the Israelites have left Egypt and they are free from slavery. God saved them through raising up a dude named Moses. And so they go from 400 years of slavery in Egypt into the desert, and they end up at this mountain called Sinai. 
They had been waiting, again, 400 years for God to rescue them, to come for them, to show them the way to freedom. And now, God had intervened and brought them up out of pain and suffering into liberty. So, as we come to this story, the people are waiting at the bottom of the mountain while Moses goes to the top to meet with God. God's presence on the peak is expressed in a thick cloud, thunder and peals of lightning, and a trumpet blast. At that moment, God gives what came to be known as the Ten Commandments, and, and people tend to not really like these today. But hold on tight, because we're going to dive into what one in particular means. So beginning in verse 7, Exodus chapter 20, it says, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall do no work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. That's Exodus 20, 7 to 11. So in verse 2 of this same chapter, God himself begins by saying this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. God is revealing himself to the people. And in doing so, he says, I am your God. He's expressing that he gives himself to them. And much later in the story, we see that fully expressed in Jesus, that this God gives himself to and for his beloved. In another book of the Bible called Song of Songs, we see a love story between a couple, which is beautiful. And in addition to teaching us about authentic intimacy and romance, it also is a metaphorical picture of God and his beloved. And in that story, the woman representing God's beloved says, my beloved is mine and I am his. That's Song of Songs 2.16. This is the God that I'm talking about. The same one that we're reading about who's on that mountain with Moses. God wants to be their God and, and, and they be his people. God is committing himself to, to a belonging, to an exclusive relationship, to, to a marriage of sorts. The Bible word for this is covenant, and covenant is like a contract, but also way more, because covenant is unbreakable. Covenant is a soul-to-soul -soul type of deal. So in this story, God is making a covenant with his people, which would later be called the Mosaic Covenant. God is saying, I will be yours and you will be mine. And God would one day fulfill this covenant in the fullest sense by signing on the dotted line with his own blood when Christ was crucified. Before this covenant, there was another God, uh, sorry, another covenant that God made with Abraham called the Abrahamic Covenant. God's covenant with Abraham set up the relationship between God and his people. And this covenant made at Sinai helped explain what that relationship needed to function. In the story that we've read, we see the terms of God's relationship with humanity, as seen first through the relationship with his chosen people, Israel. But the word terms is so clinical and judicial. Another word for terms that better describes what we see here is vows. What we've read here in, in this part of the story is, is like marriage vows. God is pledging himself to his people and, and asking them to do the same. When Kristen and I got married, we, we wrote our own vows. We promised to, to love and to take care of each other. The Ten Commandments are the terms of the covenant, the, the vows to which um, God is asking his people to pledge themselves. Vows are, are different than, than, than rules because when I married Kristen, I chose then to, to put her first to the exclusion of all others. I promised to give myself only to her, that I would be intimate with only her. That means saying no to anyone else. Not because I have to, but because I want to. You could say that it's a rule, but I see it as an outflow of my love. I don't want to be with anyone else. Vows are evidence of a promise, and love is what fuels it. So in these, 
these vows, what we see is, is God asking them to, to be mine. I was raised to read Exodus 20 verse 7 to mean don't say, oh my G-O-D, or, or things of that nature. And for years I thought that God would get really mad if I did that, that it was this egregious sin. But I've realized that is a shallow interpretation, that it's actually so much more. What is translated sometimes as take the Lord's name in vain or misuse covers more than just mere words. The word misuse comes from the Hebrew word nasach which means lift, carry, or take. Orthodox Jews don't say the name of God fully. The name of God throughout the Old Testament is Yahweh. And in scripture, it's shortened to four Hebrew characters, Yod, He, Vav, and He in the original Hebrew. And in our scriptures, it's written as Lord in all capitals. The Jews believe that the name of God is so sacred and holy that it shouldn't be uttered fully. But misusing God's name is, is more than a careless word or two, because in scripture, a name is more than a name. A name is defining. It's indicative of, of character, which is why when God changes people in, in big ways in the story of scripture, he changes their name. Jacob, for example, became Israel because he struggled with God. And Saul became Paul when he transformed from a persecutor to a preacher. Name is weighty because character is weighty. So when God says not to misuse his name, he's talking about his character, his identity, because when we associate ourselves with someone or something, we are representing it. When we become Christians, we represent the name of God from then on. We, we bear the name. And when we bear the name, God says to do it well, to do it faithfully. If we bear the name, we need to take that seriously. The name of God is so sweet that there should be no bitter words in our mouth. His name is so pure that there should be no impure actions or motives in us. His name is so mysterious that there should be no claim to have him completely figured out. His name is so loving that there should be no hatred, gossip, injustice, or pride in our practice. Too many people, like Gandhi, have been turned away from Christ because of Christianity. Because the religion doesn't always do justice to the relationship. That's why God said at Sinai to not misuse his name, to not misrepresent him and his character. All of us, we all bear the image of God. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. We all bear the image of Yahweh, but not everyone bears the name. Bearing the image is unconscious and unchanging. Everyone bears the image of God from birth, whether or not they try to do so. The image of God cannot be separated from humans. We can cover it up, we can smear mud on it, but it remains unchanged, even though it might be hidden. The name, on the other hand, has to be taken up consciously. Taking the name is about covenant and vows, about love. It's about our love for him, his love for us, that drives us to represent him with honor. Everyone bears the image of God, but not everyone is an imager of God. Imagers, as Michael Heiser said, are those who, who take the name and, and carry it in addition to that image that they already bear, representing God's character. That's hard to do, and, and none of us do it perfect, but there was one who did. Jesus is the prime example. He was the exact representation of the Father, as it says in Hebrews. When we see Jesus, we see God because the Father, Son, and Spirit are one. Jesus said in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. In John 15, 5, Jesus says, I am the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And there's so much more that we could say, but from those two passages of scripture, we see that, that Jesus lessened people's burdens and that he is the vine through whom all fruit is produced. So how do you know if you're representing Jesus? As I mentioned in the beginning, if we are like Jesus, then the hurting come closer. And as it says in, in Matthew's gospel, they, they, they find rest. We can't represent him unless we're connected 
to him. And we can know if we're connected to him based on the fruit that's growing or not growing in our life. The fruit of the Spirit, some of them are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, self-control. And not just for the people that we like, but also exemplifying all of those traits to those who we hate or those who hate us. Because Jesus is all about loving enemies. When you bear the name, love is an outflow. And when love is an outflow, you can't help but extend it to all people because all people bear that image of God. To bear the name is to recognize it in all people and to protect it in all people. Amago Dei is a Latin translation of the words image of God found in early Latin manuscripts. Those Latin words have come to name the truth that we hold to that all people bear the image of God, as we said earlier. So much of the sin in this world stems from dehumanizing ourselves or others. And you can't dehumanize someone in whom you see the image of God, that Imago Dei. So to bear the name of Christ is to recognize his fingerprints in every human everywhere. To, to bear the name of Jesus is to uphold the dignity of each life to protect those who are vulnerable, powerless, oppressed, marginalized, mistreated, cheated, or abused. John, speaking of Jesus, says this in the first chapter of his gospel in verses 11 and 12. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And actually, I, I love how the message translation puts this passage. The message says it like this. He was in the world. The world was, was there through him. And yet the world didn't even notice. He came to his own people, but they didn't want him. But whoever did want him, whoever believed he was who he claimed and would do what he said, he made to be their true selves, their child of God selves. The byproduct of taking up the name of God is becoming your true self. The byproduct of you becoming your true self is helping others do the same. And it can't be done without Jesus. So there lies the impetus for the Great Commission. As you become fully alive and awake to the glory of God all around you, woven into the fabric of creation, as you become more and more whole, more like Jesus, you share that. Not because you, you have to, but because you get to. What a privilege it is to take up and carry the name of Jesus, to do our best to represent him. I've really struggled over the last year seeing the way in which some people claim to represent Jesus. This, the things that some people have done or not done in his name are gross to me. Their actions seem to bear no resemblance to Jesus Christ, some people, sometimes. And it makes me so angry because they are misrepresenting him. They are misusing his name. When white supremacy is upheld with faith, the name of God is being misused. When silence in the face of anti-black racism is justified using the excuse of faith, the name of God is being misused. When Asian hatred is tolerated, when injustice is allowed and left unchecked by Christians, the name name of God is being misused. I've had some conversations with God where my anger towards that certain type of Christian is, is fully vented. And when I'm done, God responds. He reminds me that I can't control them. I can acknowledge and name the evil that I see, but that's not enough because I can't force anyone to change. That has to be an inside job by the Spirit of God. God always reminds me to do my best to represent him as well and as faithfully as I possibly can. To show the world what Jesus is really like. To live for and like him. Now that is a tall order. No doubt about it. Because I am so unlike Jesus in so many ways. I am in progress, on the journey, heading in the right direction. Walking with Jesus to the best of my ability. So how can I bear his name better tomorrow than I did today? My wife, Kristen, drinks tea. She loves a cup of Earl Grey from a place called David's Tea. And I've noticed that the longer she keeps the tea bag in the water, the more the water changes. 
The tea changes the water from simple H2O into something new and flavorful and delicious. Some teas introduce nutrients into the water and vitamins and things that help your body be its best. Sometimes she leaves the, the tea bag in for a little bit too long. The, the tea tastes really strong and at that point it's ready to be poured out into other mugs to make more tea. The longer the bag is in the water, the more that cup of tea can replicate itself. One cup can become two, two can become four, and so on and so on. God's presence is like this. Some of us have some weak tea because we're not steeped in the Spirit of God. We pop in and we pop out. And you know when you meet someone who is steeped in Jesus, there is this metaphorical aroma. There is a peace. There is something different that you notice about them. Their tea is so full of flavor and vibrance. That second part of the passage talks about Sabbath. And we talked about Sabbath a few months ago, that Sabbath is meant to be an architecture of time in which you can enjoy God and his creation to rest. As we've said before, it's not enough to unplug from the world. We need to also plug into the presence of God. That's how we become a set-apart people. That's how we bear the name. That's how the fruit of the Spirit grows. And when you Sabbath correctly, you live all seven days different. You bear the name well, not just on Sunday, but every day because you've taken time in him, steeping yourself in him. Every day your tea becomes fragrant and delicious. It makes others come closer, just like they did to Jesus. Here's what I'm saying. You were born with the image of God inside you, and you are given the choice of whether you want to bear his name whether to believe in his character and to live by it, whether to follow him or not. And when you decide to bear the name, you become an imager of God, actively showing what he is like to the world. That's what it means to use his name correctly, to emulate him faithfully, to go and do likewise. To do that, we need to be steeped in his presence. And when we are, the world will want some of that delicious, life-giving tea. And that tea is the presence of God where each of us was meant to be. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much. Lord, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your name, for your character of love. Lord, that you are love, that love just oozes out of you. Lord, that your heart breaks for the world that we live in. Lord, that you call us into your presence. You call us home and we become who we are, which is your children. Lord, I ask that you would help us to model you well, to take up the name and to bear it well, to bear your character well, Lord, so that the world might take notice and want some of this sweet, delicious tea that is you, that is your presence, that is your kingdom. Lord, help us to, to model you well. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys.